Okay, so let's let's get underway. I am um, really excited to be launching this seminar series. Uh, we, for those of you just joining, we we're just chatting about the fact that it's it's just such an amazing community of people, and we're hoping that this seminar series will provide sort of just a regular spot in everybody's week where we can uh, uh, share our work. Um, just so you know, I'm, I'm, we are developing the set of norms around this. Um, uh, so we're just we're going to jump in. Uh, I think the goal is that we want talks that are, you know, they're, they're recently high level. They're, they're your work. So they're not um, a talk for a lay audience or definitely for our academic audience. We want people to get into the details. Uh, but of course, we want it also to be something that is hopefully accessible across people's different fields of expertise. Uh, I really want to encourage people, it's so hard in Zoom uh, uh, to, to jump in, but I really want to encourage people to, uh, to do that as, as comfortably uh, as you can, um, especially uh, if, if there's a clarification that's going to make sense, like if somebody has used a a shorthand for something or a, you know, a bit of jargon that's not from your domain of expertise, uh, I think please feel free to, to, to jump in and say, wait, could you just define that term for me? Or when you say that word, what do you mean? Um, it will always be available to the speaker and, and the moderator if needed to, uh, to suggest that we'll hold that, you know, if, if a conversation is, as some academics are known to do, to convert <laughs> a question of clarification into let's let's get into the real nitty gritty of the real uh, debate on this on this concept. Uh, so we might move that into the discussion. Um, I'm going to aim for uh, a talk that I'd like to think will be done in 45 minutes. I won't feel like I've completely abused your time if it takes me a little bit over that, but we really are trying to get some time in here for for discussion uh, in this format as well. Um, Okay, so and, and uh, Brent is also going to monitor the chat. Um, and uh, are we, we in chat? We have chat. We don't have question and answer. We have chat, right? So, so throw your questions, comments into the chat. Brent will be keeping track of that. And Brent, you should just also feel totally free to, to talk over me and interrupt if there's something that you think I need to respond to or know about. Perfect. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see. Now we have to do the sharing my screen. And we're off. And even though I always advise people don't start out with an apology, um, uh, I'm going to apologize a little bit because I know there's a few people in this audience who have heard me talk about some of these ideas before. So uh, I'll apologize to those people, but it's. Um, I really wanted to kind of cover uh, sort of some core ideas that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and can I, Brent, I can just confirm, I realize I've, I've totally lost my view of chats or anything like that. So number one, everybody can see everything. Yes? Mine's gone into Yeah, it looks good. Yep, we're good, we're good. So Brent, you uh, definitely talk up uh, because I can't see the, I can't see the chat at all. Um, okay, so uh, topic is uh, why the science of AI needs a science of normativity. Um, and this is really a motivator for me in uh, what we're trying to build at schwartz Reisman and the type of work, uh, but it's of course not the only type of work we need to be doing. So I wanna be clear, this is now me talking in my researcher capacity. Um, uh, uh, we are a, a big tent. Um, and Brian Campbell Smith and I have already had conversations about the science of normativity concepts. So I hope we'll come back to those. So, but what's the context for this? Um, let's see. Well, it would be nice if my machine would advance the slides. Not happening. All right, hang on a second, folks. I have totally lost. There, did it, did it transfer? Yes. How will we make sure that ubiquitous and powerful AI makes us better and not worse off so because we know in the um hmm. sorry of course i've given like a hundred talks uh on zoom but this one is not working uh, all right did that advance to the killer robot 
Yeah. Yes. yes, we're at the killer. Yeah, okay, right, okay. So killer robot, uh, somehow something's weird going on. Okay, killer robot, that's what a lot of people think of, but really um, the, the bigger issue uh, is the alignment question. And if, if I could see all of you, I'd ask for a show of hands who recognizes the reference here. And uh, you'll reveal your age, I think, because I've asked some of my classes and students, they don't know that this is how from 2001, the Space Odyssey, who refuses to open the pod bay doors um, when, uh, when Dave asked him to do that and let him back in. Um, and that's one of the ways of thinking about the alignment problem. If you build machines that just do what you program them to do, what you built them to do, uh, does that continue to stay aligned with, with our interests? But of course, it's lots of other things as well. It's, uh, we're trying to think about what do we do about ubiquitous uh, surveillance and facial recognition. And these are actually probably a little bit of um, uh, gate uh, uh, recognition as well here. Um, what, what, are we, what are we doing about that set of issues? And many of you, of course, have, uh, know about the, uh, this is from the ProPublica publication that looked at uh, racial discrimination in algorithms used in, um, in bail decisions uh, in the US. Um, we're uh, all familiar with now old examples like Cambridge Analytica um, getting ready for what's happening with the 2020 election. And then this one that uh, I found just recently, which is very, very sad to see. Um, this is uh, how often, how many times per week teenagers hang out with their friends uh, without their parents. They go out with their friends and that, that drop off uh, there with the release of the, of the iPhone. So what's happening in terms of social interaction. Now, the reason that I want to think about normativity is uh, because I think that's fundamental that we're talking about when we think about artificial intelligence. So many of you have seen that this is my current favorite definition of artificial intelligence as uh, keying into the idea that what intelligence is, is the quality that it enables an entity to act, to function appropriately and with foresight in its environment. And it's that word appropriately, which is a normative term. Um, that really makes this, uh, I, th I think, a, a critical way of thinking about what we mean by artificial intelligence. Uh, now, I spend a lot of time thinking about normative, normativity, and I know many of you think about normativity. There are multiple ways in which we all think about normativity, uh, lots of different uh, definitions of normativity. The way I'm thinking about normativity is as uh, from, from a, a very much from a, that social science perspective, uh, that Outside, outside the system, visitor from apparently Venus um, to say, what is it these folks do? Uh, it's the human practice of classifying behaviors as appropriate or not. This is an okay action, this is not an okay action. And then channeling, devising social systems to channel behaviors towards the deemed appropriate actions. Now people thinking about robots and AI have been thinking about how do we channel uh, behavior of robots in the appropriate direction uh, from, uh, but as long as we, I guess, well, I'm not sure how long we think about robots. It goes back quite a way, but certainly Asimov in the early 40s was writing about, anybody that knows the famous um, uh, uh, three laws of robotics. Uh, robot may not injure a human being, must obey orders, uh, must protect its own existence as long as doing so doesn't come in conflict with the first or second laws. And it, the, the stories, uh, which uh, if you haven't had a chance to read, I, it, it's really, really well worth it if you like to think about these questions of alignment and normativity. Um, you know, in the conception that uh, uh, Asimov was talking about, the, those rules are built most deeply into the robot positronic brain. Um, and then conflicts between the various rules are ironed out by different positronic potentials in the brain. So the idea that the engineering itself is resolving the, uh, the normativity problem by building right into that math or engineering um, uh, how you reconcile those. But then what's great about the, the story where these are introduced called Runaround is in fact what we discover, and this is what lawyers and philosophers know well, um, you can never really specify sufficiently completely any rule to say what is the right resolution of trade-offs um, uh, in any particular in any particular context. So in run around, the robot is is literally running around in circles uh, because the uh, the rules are in complete equipoise, and so there's no action. 
Now that's, that's from the early 40s, thinking about how you would align uh, robots with human interests. And a lot of the work that's being done today on thinking about how do we achieve that alignment is also thinking about it from the point of view of how would you build into the machine uh, the right rules, the difference from right and, and wrong. Uh, Wendell Wallach, a uh, dear friend and a great uh, writer in this area, so, so this, his book from a while ago, a uh, short while ago, uh, Moral Machines, Teaching Robots Right from Wrong. Some of you may have seen the uh, MIT Media Lab's uh, online uh, experiments with the now infamous uh, trolley problem, but they're collecting data, asking people to go to the website uh, to select what should the self-driving car do in these different circumstances. Uh, should it kill the uh, should it kill the occupants of the car? Or should it kill the uh, the the people who are in the, the crosswalk? So that's collecting, in one sense, information about the values of people who are going to the website and clicking a choice there. But the, my starting point on this is that we can't really embed values in machines. I mean, we could certainly there are certainly probably ways. There are ways to to design your machines if they don't ever do this. But as a strategy, as a theory. I think this is a deeply problematic approach to the alignment uh, problem because values are the equilibria of normative systems. They're not objects in the environment. They're not data. They're in fact the product of our normative systems and our interactions. And so I, as a, my, my training is as an economist, I use uh, positive models, building models, predictive models of uh, how different agents in different environments will behave. So thinking about values as the equilibria of normative systems. And that means that we have to think about value alignment of getting machines to align with human values is not a question of embedding, but rather aligning with the equilibria of human normative systems. Now I, um, I, I linked uh, a couple of papers for this talk for anybody who wants to do any more reading. So uh, um, Hadfield Manel, um, my co-author, and yes, also my son, uh, and I have a paper on thinking about incomplete contracting and AI alignment and the ways in which actually our economic and legal analysis of the incomplete contracting problem helps us think about the AI alignment problem. And uh, part of the recommendation there is we need to think about how we embed the design of machines into this much bigger normative structure, which is how humans solve the problem of incomplete contracting. I'm not gonna say very much more about, about that work here, but, uh, but that is linked if you'd like to take a look. So this is my claim that we need uh, serious social science of how normative systems work. Now, of course, we have lots and lots of uh, social science and uh, hum humanities work being done about normativity. Um, but I think if we look across sort of the span of what's happening in you know, all different kinds of locations across our university campuses, what we see is a lot of attention to studying particular uh, particular norms or accounting for particular norms um, for you know, deep, rich understanding of some normative systems for analysis of uh, certainly from a normative perspective of what is good and what is bad. How should we choose? How should we label this behavior as between uh, appropriate and not appropriate, good, not good, um, uh, and so on. And what I'm trying to uh, promote is thinking about, uh, in this line of work, studying normativity as a phenomenon per se. That is something that emerged, uh, and how, what are the characteristics of that? What explains the emergence of this normative labeling? Uh, what functions does it perform? What characteristics do normative systems share? What makes a normative system stable and adaptive? Um, so I like to think about that in this very, very broad sense. And one of the reasons I'm, um, I think I saw Dennis uh, quickly in the room, very delighted that uh, Dennis Walsh, who thinks about uh, normativity from an evolutionary perspective, is, is a member of our, uh, of our group. And I think it's really uh, critical to sort of see it from that evolutionary perspective and as a phenomenon that emerges. Um, and I think we can even relate it to um, uh, concepts like the transitions uh, in evolution, about which I know not very much at all, uh, but it, except that it seems to align well with some of the thinking that I think we need to do about human normativity. Um, so uh, Maynard Smith and, and Seth Murphy um, uh, talk about the sort of leaps in evolutionary 
passed into to increasing levels of complexity from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, single cell to multi multicellular organisms, um, solitary individuals to colonies like ants and bees. And at each of these jumps, they, they argue, what you see is a transition in uh, the organization of the replication from, from individual elements to group elements, uh, that group then displaying a division of labor and getting the gains of specialization, something, of course, that's uh, very attractive to me as an economist, thinking about the ways in which the division of labor facilitates specialization and therefore facilitates uh, increased uh, surplus and growth. And they also focus on the ways in which information storage and transmission changes at, at these boundaries. But the thing that was interesting to me, and I was at a conference uh, where I, I, I was lucky to uh, have a chance to talk with Ursh uh, Smith Murthy about these ideas. And I was very interested in this, uh, the way they thought about the shift at the, transit, the transition from primates uh, to human. They really emphasized language, information transmission at that, at that boundary. And obviously quite critical, um, but I think one of the things we need to be focused on is how normativity happens at that, at that boundary. And again, we can have lots of discussions about um, normative concepts in other animal societies, um, more generally different concepts of normativity. But remember, I'm thinking about normativity as a shared social classification of behaviors as appropriate or not, and the organization of behavior to direct actions towards the appropriate. So it's not the same as saying that there are in other uh, primate communities not um, uh, moral values or it's another, another line of work. But I'm interested in the emergence of that kind of structure, that normative structure of lab labeling behaviors. Um, so a reminder that I'm thinking about normativity as the shared binary classifications of actions. Basically, this is an okay action, this is not an okay action. And what's really critical about normativity, I think, and this is kind of a strange way to think about this in some contexts and from some perspectives, um, because we have a lot of conversations about normativity. They're about what is the right thing to do? What is the good thing to do? And what I'm trying to do, thinking about normativity as a phenomenon, as a structure, is say what's really quite important about normativity is that it's capable of arbitrary content. And what I mean by arbitrary content is not that it uh, is necessarily meaningless or uh, random. There may be lots of things that are driving the content in one direction or another. But I mean arbitrary in the sense, like in mathematics, a variable can take on whatever content you put into it. Um, and that's what's critical about normativity, I think, is it's humans have landed on a mechanism for supplying the rules of normativity for groups. And I think this is uh, really uh, central to the enormous uh, capacity for adaptation and human evolutionary advantage. Um, let me see, I think I just, I flip too forward there. Um, so uh, in work that I've done with uh, Barry Weingast, who's a political scientist at, um, at Stanford, we've been thinking about, maybe about six or seven papers now, um, this concept of the normative social order. And we look at that from the perspective, again, of an equilibrium in which behavior in a group is patterned on a shared normative classification. I also linked this, this particular paper, um, the micro foundations of the rule of law, which sort of just dis, uh, discusses, it doesn't have the model in it, but it discusses the model and discusses the big, basic set of ideas and relates it to other way of thinking about normative social order. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting different screens here. So I'm just getting a bit confused with what's coming up next. Um, what we emphasize is that a normative social order can be thought of as having uh, two key components. One is a classification institution. That is the mechanism by which classifications are generated in a particular type of order. Now we want, to, I'm using the term institution here in the way that Douglas North, uh, for those of you who know, 
or transaction cost economics or institutional theory uh, talks about institutions as the rules of the game in a human society. And you want to think of that as something different from formal organization. So you don't want to get a picture in your head of like the Supreme Court of Canada. That is actually a classification institution, but it doesn't have to be that type of an institution. It is simply the way in which the mechanism in, by which classifications are generated. And associated with that is uh, an enforcement mechanism that then is providing the uh, incentive structure that directs behavior uh, along the lines that are set out in the classification institution. So and I'm going to be focused here on the penalty type, the enforcement type of mechanism that attaches costs to the choice of an action that's been labeled by your classification institution as not okay. So we want to think now about how would we describe what's happening in a regime of social norms, which is one of the ways in which people think about the use of the language of culture. Uh, what's happening, uh, how do we understand that within this, within this framework? So in, in the, we would think about, this is Weingasten and I would think about social norms or culture as a setting in which the classification institution is emergent. It's, done, it's, it's accomplished by practice. We don't know how a behavior is classified until we see the interactions of lots and lots of agents settling into a pattern. Um, it's, a, it's an emergent feature of interactions. The enforcement mechanism in a setting where uh, social order is generated through social norms is what we call decentralized collective punishment. Now we use this language of punishment, um, which can sort of sound like you know beating somebody up, and we just want to say no. It includes everything from uh, you know a formal um, uh, negative consequence like a fine or like an imprisonment, but it, it, in a social norm setting. Uh, we could be talking about primarily things like just disapproval of somebody's behavior. A raised eyebrow is, uh, is punishment. Criticism, which is a critical way in which, critical, uh, central way in which we uh, supply, uh, supply uh, negative feedback punishments for um, taking, taking the wrong action. Um, there's some lovely work uh, in anthropology uh, about how in different communities um, uh, different, the enforcement mechanisms kind of escalate from mocking behavior, making fun of somebody who's not following the rules, to mild criticism, to more significant criticism, and then the most uh, 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 widespread technique that we also see once we have to get up to that level where criticism is not working is exclusion from a group or exclusion from the community. Now, the way I'm thinking about things, that shared classification if it is reliably implemented in an equilibrium, supports the division of labor and specialization and the hypersociality that uh, we associate with humans and the capacity for exchange. Uh, we can't get the capacity for exchange, even the type of exchange we say see in hunter-gatherer environments uh, where you know, somebody goes to get water and somebody goes to get food and somebody else is, is making sure the children don't fall into the fire. And then there's the exchange of those services and goods within that community uh, organized around a normative structure that says, okay, if you went and got water, if you're at the fire at, at dinner time, you get to eat and it would be wrong to exclude you. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, that shared classification produces economic surplus and growth. Now thinking about this again in this uh, evolutionary sense, what's important there is that as we get growth, as we get increased amounts of specialization, and an expanding division of labor, we get increased complexity in human society. There's more types of things that people are doing. There's more types of goods and services that are being produced. There's more types of exchange that are being engaged in. And that complexity generates, um, critically, ambiguity in classification. Because if your society is dynamic and growing increasingly complex because it's successful, there are things we didn't classify before. There are new ways of interaction, new products, new services, new jobs, et cetera. And there's ambiguity about is that okay or not okay. Uh, that generates a, a challenge to coordination and incentives. And that 
for wine guests and, and myself, that is what generates the demand for an ambiguity resolving institution. So we could be doing all of our classification uh, as we do through early human societies through uh, just our emergent practices, our discursive practices. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's, it's emergent, it's from behavior. We just see how the response evolves. But as we get more complex, we see a demand for an ambiguity resolving institution. And for us, that's what law is. Fundamentally, law is the emergence of a centralized institution that's capable of supplying deliberate content to classification. So we don't have to just wait around to see if the rules will change. We actually have an institution, a structure that's capable of articulating the rules, uh, the rules have changed. And that's fundamental to what's different between a, um, an emergent or cultural social order and a legal order in our thinking. And that's also very critical. This is why it's important for adaptation. That creates the potential for policy. That creates the, the potential for saying, you know, we've been doing it this way. We really should do it a different way. Um, we have had a rule that all, um, only the men pick yams and only the women pick sweet potatoes, which is a real uh, norm in some communities uh, that, that we've studied in the world. Um, but the yams have, have all disappeared. We need to transition to a world where it's okay for men to pick sweet potatoes. If we have an institution that's capable of announcing that and making that change in the classification without disrupting the equilibrium, and remember the equilibrium here is just supported by decentralized enforcement, that's what we mean by a legal order. So notice that we don't define a legal order as the emergence of governments, and we don't define it as the, as the emergence of centralized or official enforcement. The challenge of coordinating that decentralized enforcement, um, and so we need to incentivize people to participate in, in supplying criticism for the things that we've now said should be criticized or exclusion for the stuff we now say should, should generate uh, exclusion and coordinating people. In our analysis, that generates uh, constraints on your classification institution. That tells us what your classification institution uh, needs to look like. So I mentioned that uh, Barry and I have a, a line of, of papers um, and what we argue then are these micro foundations of law is that the class, we, we show that the, the attributes of that classification institution that support an equilibrium uh, require that the classification institution has characteristics like its common knowledge. It's clear, it's stable, uh, it implements neutral and impersonal reasoning, meaning reasoning that anybody can implement. You don't need, the, the outcome of classification doesn't depend on the identity of who's doing the classification. Universality in the sense that at least for everybody who is required to maintain the stability of the enforcement mechanism, they have to see something uh, something in the rules for them. That doesn't mean we don't have exclusion, that doesn't mean we don't have um, terrible treatment for groups, for populations. So one of the papers in this list here looks at this in uh, ancient Athens, uh, for example. And of course, ancient Athens, 200,000 people, only 30,000 of which are the male citizens who participate in the legal order. Um, uh, but we, so we say, at least for that group, as they're defined there, there's nothing necessarily good or attractive about these societies other than their capacity to maintain legal order around an institution that can um, uh, change the rules uh, as deemed appropriate. Okay, so this focuses attention on thinking about, and this is what, again, this is like thinking about what I'm trying to develop and think about as a science of normativity. What are the features of normativity is this focus on, okay, what are the attributes that support group stability, and robustness. And uh, one of the key things that we've been focusing on um, in this work of late is to think about the fact, well, one of the things we see is that rules come in sets. So this is uh, Hammurabi's code, the image there, for those of you who might or might not recognize it, you know, seven foot black stone uh, pillar, uh, it's got 257 different rules in it, uh, the vast majority of which, by the way, are uh, dealing with commercial and contract um, uh, exchange. Um, 
and uh, but it's organized in a set, right? This is all of the rules on that black pillar are parts of something called Hammurabi's code, and we can now talk coherently about do you follow the code? Is it consistent with the code? Because um, we can talk about those rules in sets. Um, and this is um, a critical point I'm going to talk quite a bit more about in the remainder of this talk is the idea that groups can be defined, or in our thinking are now defined by their rule sets. That is to say, what distinguishes group A from group B is that group A has a different rule, set of rules than group B. And that is, we can think about this in this evolutionary context of thinking about this in terms of the competitive pressure uh, that exists between groups where there's a capacity to make choice about membership, which group you're going to join or not join. So think about members of a, um, uh, a religious community, for example, um, in you know, our highly diverse uh, societies, people in those groups have the, have some choice to make about whether to continue to follow, at least in some domains of their life, the, the set of rules of that small community, or whether to basically go join into the, the larger group um, uh, by no longer following uh, those rules or following a different set of rules. Um, and then we can also think about this from the point of view of competition between groups and the effectiveness of the rules um, uh, and the, and the, the extent to which they the, they have landed onto a system of rules that promotes the stability and robustness of that group. So now I'm going to start talking about something that a number of you have heard me talk about before, um, although maybe not in as much detail, um, and that's the concept of silly rules. This is both, I think, a really important concept in understanding normativity, and it's also a demonstration of the importance of thinking about normativity as a phenomenon and focusing not on the content of particular rules but rather the attributes of the normative system because it's hard to answer questions about why we have silly rules if our approach to um, explaining or predicting rules is uh, functional if we say well we have this rule because it coordinates better or we have that rule because it encourages people to uh, to share uh, nicely. Um, the definition that I'm using here of silly rules are rules where there is no direct impact on the payoff for anybody in the group. Um, and, and yet what we're going to show is that they nonetheless contribute to the robustness of a group. Okay, so let's think about silly rules. Well, we're actually getting a lot of um, exposure to the concept of silly rules uh, these days. Um, so, mask wearing. In September 2020, wearing a mask is not a silly rule. Wearing one has a direct impact on payoff. We're not quite sure if it has a direct impact um, on the payoff for the individual wearing the mask, but we're pretty sure it has a direct impact on uh, the level of virus uh, throughout a community. So having a rule that says, the appropriate behavior, the okay behavior, is wearing a, a mask is not a silly rule. In September of 2019, I'd argue, we had a silly rule about masks, and it was, you don't wear one if you're not a medical professional or ill. Um, and if I had walked down Parliament Street right outside my, my house here, uh, with a, a medical mask on, um, uh, you know, last year, and I'm not sick, and um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to protect myself or others from an illness that I have, um, I would be violating a rule that we have that says, well, we don't, in this community, in this society, we don't wear masks like that in public, except for a medical reason. And I think that's actually, uh, and, and I would anticipate, and I think this is a part of, for many of us, making the transition to wearing a mask in public was, well, I'm gonna feel kind of self-conscious. I'm gonna feel kind of silly. I'm gonna think people are looking at me funny if I wear that, wear that mask. Now, of course, we've also seen the mask wearing has taken on a kinds of normative significance. And I think it's a really fascinating example. But I think it's also really tricky to, um, to think about uh, silly rules 
in our own context and for a reason I'm going to address, which is uh, because it actually we are so good at being humans and members of our group that it's tricky to see what are the rules that are important and what are the ones that clearly there are rules that we have that really just you could say, look, the world be no different if uh, we wore bright colors instead of muted colors, uh, if we um, ate with a, a instrument that looked like this rather than an instrument that looked like that, if we use this language versus language, that language. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, uh, present some work that talks about two different uh, papers um, uh, and, and explores two different claims about, about silly rules and, and their functioning. Um, the, the first one is from a published paper, uh, also with Dylan and a graduate student at Berkeley, McCain Andrus, um, uh, and we, we included a link to that one in the, in the materials. So here claim one is, silly rules contribute to the robustness of groups. Okay, now as I said, I'm going to use an example about, just to sort of illustrate this, about something that's very remote from, from most of our uh, experience. This is, uh, from a very a lovely ethnography of arrow making among the Awa uh, hunter gatherers of, of Brazil. Um, uh, these pictures, these, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see. These are men engaged, and it is only men who engage in this. Um, the uh, building of, of arrows, uh, there's all the steps that have been laid out, the slightly odd uh, picture with the, you can see a, a hind leg of, of an animal over the fire. That's actually uh, illustrating a rule about keeping arrows warm. So if you went into this community and said, okay, so what are the rules? What are the norms? What are the rules about uh, making arrows among the Awa? And I, I've just pulled a number of these out from this ethnography. You use hardwood for the shaft, you use bamboo for the arrowhead, you put feathers on the end of it. You only use dark feathers. You smoke the arrows over a fire at all times while the arrow is active, which is not the same as in use. It just means that it uh, hasn't been put to bed for and, and wrapped up for a period of time. It's, it's a potentially used arrow. Um, you make and use only personalized arrows. I did also mention it's only men who make arrows. Uh, the arrows um, have a length that is uh, sort of in this 1.4 to 1.7 meter range, but it's, it's customized to the person who's built it. Um, and uh, the norm is that you make and carry many more arrows than used. Uh, now, if you also went and looked at to this community, and this is what these ethnographers did, uh, you see that men spend uh, over four hours a day making and repairing arrows. Um, in the season during which the, the ethnographers were observing this behavior, uh, they saw um, men in the group uh, carry 402 arrows with them on, on hunting trips. They only used nine of them, and many of them got damaged because they get carried. You could see that in the, um, the picture, which I, I seem to have lost my ability to jump around in my slides. But anyway, they, they get carried in large, in large bundles. Carrying them in large bundles also means that many of them uh, will be uh, damaged, um, and they kill most of their uh, prey with shotguns, um, and they don't use the arrows. But the man who makes his arrows differently is mocked and shunned from the community, and the rules are deeply meaningful, and that's really the focus of the ethnographer's work as well, is to unpack the, the meaning in many of these rules that we could look at and say, well, some of these don't seem to be highly related to the functionality of uh, achieving the objective of arrows, which is, is to, uh, to, to get food. The, the rules have a lot of religious significance. Um, the colorful feathers, for example, uh, color, color is related to religious symbolism. Um, uh, so you only use dark feathers because that's not the appropriate context. Women use colorful feathers for religious articles and so on. So now I want to think about this question, which group is better? Let's imagine we could just come in and, and divide up. So, okay. Uh, and I'm just going to call the first three rules here important rules. I don't know anything about making arrows. It may be that there's a difference between the colorful feathers and the dark feathers other than color. Uh, but I'm just going to, to illustrate my point, would you rather uh, live in the world that has just the important rules that seem to contribute to the uh, productivity of the arrow, so to speak, or in the world that has these additional rules, 
that seem to have these silly qualities. Silly in my formal definition of don't have a direct impact on payoff, don't directly affect the capacity of the arrow uh, to bring down prey. The man who makes his arrows differently does not have difficulty um, uh, feeding his family, um, but he's nonetheless mocked for, for the way he does his arrows. So to investigate a question like this, we put together a computational experiment um, in which we, um, uh, this is a, uh, it's formally, it's a, it's a, uh, just, it's just a running this constant um, updating. We have agents, we have a hundred agents, these are just mathematical agents um, who are constantly engaged, repeatedly engaged in interactions with other agents in a group. The group is defined by its rule set they engage in the sequence and each interaction is governed by a different randomly selected rule from the rule set. Now there's no content to the rules in this experiment. They the only differentiation is you draw a rule that has no impact if it's violated. Doesn't matter whether I wore a hat or didn't wear a hat um, right now. Um, uh, and then some rules have, a, have, a, have a, a, an impact on, um, on actual payoff um, and so that there would be, um, uh, there's an actual material consequence if there's a violation of the rule. And in our groups, there's a high value, we've defined this, so there's a high value to group membership if the important rules are enforced. Um, uh, and uh, so, so you, you want to think about that as an example, like rules about sharing food, rules about enforcing contracts, rules about protecting people's uh, investment, if they've, if they've built a tool and they've invested their time, then uh, giving them capacity to make use of that and not having it taken by somebody else. Individuals in this group are um, facing some uncertainty, however. They, um, they don't know in this group, there's no external third party punishers, all punishment of rule violations happens by members of the group. And the uncertainty for the members, for the agents in this setting are they don't know um, what percentage of agents in their group are punishing violations of the rules. So at every step, these agents are deciding, should I stay or should I go? Should I stay in this group or not? I'm going to have another interaction, another interaction. Uh, should I stay or should I go? Um, I'd like to stay if there's enough punishers around that the important rules will be enforced. The payoff is higher to being in the group than out of the group, if that's the case. But I should leave if there's not enough punishers around and important rules be violated. And then what we do is we look at two different, we look at different communities that are defined by the proportion of silly rules in that environment. So here in the first line, you can see this is a setting where we said, okay, imagine that we basically alternate important rule. We call it important game because just a strategic interaction very simple strategic interaction, um, important, silly, important, silly. And then a, an environment with higher density of silly rules where we get two to one ratio of uh, silly rules to important rules. And then what we do in this context is we measure the value of group membership. We look at the size of each community over time because the size of the community will be a function of the decisions those agents make about whether to stay or go. You know, as agents leave, the community obviously starts to shrink in size. And then we look at the sensitivity of those results to the cost and density of the silly rules. And we look at this in, in response to what we call, in one case, a belief shock, and the other, a population and belief shock. In the context of the belief shock, we're looking at uh, a setting where the, the information, the belief structure of our agents is that they have uh, all of a sudden, let's just say, let's suppose the community was in equilibrium, and then all of a sudden there's, there, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not the, um, uh, there's enough punishers around. So you can imagine an influx of newcomers to the group, and what immediately that creates is uncertainty is, hey, these newcomers, do they help enforce our rules or not? Because if they don't, we may no longer have enough punishers around as a proportion, and I should leave. Um, but that's a belief shock uh, and not a population shock if the ground truth is those newcomers, they're just as likely to punish the rules as the uh, people who've been in this equilibrium for a long period of time. In the case of the population shock, we then look at where actually, no, those newcomers, they don't enforce the rules. So we want to know 
how do communities respond to that and how does that affect it by the structure of, of silly rules. So our hypotheses here are first that the groups with more silly rules are more likely to survive shocks to beliefs and they're likely to collapse faster in response to shocks to the truth about uh, the stability of enforcement. And that's actually when it's optimal to collapse. So that our hypotheses are the group of silly rules can ride out the bumps, uncertainties about are we still in equilibrium? Are we still playing this game this way? Um, and they will figure out more quickly when the stability of their equilibrium has shifted and do the right thing, which is, hey, I'm not sticking around this group because I'm going to get taken advantage of. I'm not going to have my contracts enforced. I'm not going to have my, uh, I'm not going to be able to benefit from, from our expectations about exchange and so on. So these is, the, the idea here is that you're getting information about the system, the state of the system, and how is that helping agents make decisions appropriately. Okay, so here's, here's our results. Um, and uh, the vertical axis here is the proportion of communities. We're running thousands of these communities with different types of rule sets, with different densities of silly rules. And we're looking at the proportion of those communities uh, that are active over time. Uh, and time is measured along the horizontal axis in terms of community, important community interactions. So we've normalized that even in the world where there's lots of silly rules, it's basically still the same time period in between an important interaction and the next important interaction. And the size of the circles here represent the size of the community. Uh, the blue circles are our environments, our groups that have a lot of silly rules, that's high density silly rules. And the orange ones are, uh, the lighter colored ones are those with uh, smaller proportions of, of silly rules. So the orange ones are actually where we have only important rules. Sounds like the world you wanna live in. Doesn't matter what color clothing you wear. It doesn't matter what words you say before you eat. Um, these are uh, th these are the worlds with just the important. And what we see here is that this is sort of this demonstration of support for hypotheses. The blue circles are bigger. Uh, they level off with uh, more fewer communities disappear. Um, and we're arguing that's a consequence of those of those silly rules. The uh, silly rules can't be too expensive. I'm not showing you that result. Um, but as long as they are sufficiently cheap, uh, they're performing that uh, robustness function. Um, this other uh, diagram is showing now, here's our population shock. This is where in fact, all the newcomers don't, uh, do, no, do not uh, enforce uh, the rules or a smaller proportion do. And what you see here is the blue communities, which are the high density, lots of silly rules communities. Uh, they collapse much more quickly uh, and more of them do. So that insight is that a group with a lot of low cost and predictive silly rules, uh, that's providing more information to the members of that group about the state of the group, how effectively the group is enforcing its set of rules, and the argument is that generates an evolutionary uh, advantage. You could think about our groups as, in fact, competing groups, which ones over time will persist, which ones will grow. Uh, this is making a prediction. It's going to be ones that have acquired the characteristics of silly rules to help them maintain the stability of that environment. So we do have a question from um, yeah. the chat, um, okay. the, the creation of, uh, of laws and um, asking uh, why does the law always seem to be years behind the application of AI? The burden of proof is on those harmed, taking years for courts to resolve rather than to do no harm. Yes, yeah, so so I, I think we, we should, can we um, try to we'll come back, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, get through the last little bit and come back to that question. Um, so please, Brent, uh, Blent, remind me, but I want, it just gives me a chance for an overarching comment, which they, what we're trying to do here is some theorizing about the structure of normative systems. And if we think about our current system, we are, we live in a world of incredibly complex legal institutions with tons and tons of factors uh, playing here. But the point that that question is bringing out is the idea that one of the functions of a legal order is to maintain uh, is to maintain uh, stability in those rules. We had, you may have seen earlier that was one of the characteristics that contributes to the capacity for an institution to maintain um, social order is that the rules are stable enough that people think they can make judgments about long-lived behaviors. Um, because they've got a good prediction about what the rules are going to be in the future, and they can look out and say, oh, I think I'm going to benefit from those rules, so I would like to help 
enforce them today. That's in tension with adaptation. That's in tension with precisely that other function I really emphasize about law, which is the capacity to change the rules, the capacity to say, the rules we have are not working well for us. How do we shift? And I think that's just a really basic tension. And it's one of the reasons I want us to be doing really, really careful um, uh, predictive work, analytical work about the way these systems work in order to be able to, one, make those predictions better, but then two, uh, and let's come back to the whole context of, of AI, um, how can we make sure that we can appropriately move those sets of rules to adapt as we need to much more quickly to an environment where technology is changing much, much faster. Um, we have, you know, we're, we certainly see, you know, as, as the world becomes more diverse, um, we have many, many different directions that uh, we want to go in terms of, of changing rules. But hopefully what's coming out is the idea of this basic tension between the stability and the adaptation. Um, and uh, Brent, I just, were there, were there other questions that were um, there that I should take now or should I continue? Uh, I would say there's another one, um, but I think uh, it's referring back to some slides ago. So I think it might make sense to uh, finish up silly rules and then we can uh, okay. return to that. All right, I'll do that then. Hopefully not too much longer. I did, I did promise 45. I said I wouldn't feel too bad if I went a bit over here. So here's my second claim that silly rules help agents learn normative behaviors. And this is work that's in progress um, uh, with some colleagues. Um, you'll see Hadfield Bunnell there again. Um, um, Rafael Custer and, and Jay Libo and colleagues at uh, DeepMind as well. Um, so here we're thinking, we're actually looking, this is, we're gonna talk about food taboos and cultural evolution only as a context to provide uh, for this setting. Um, we know that food taboos are, are ubiquitous, uh, they're highly variable, um, and it's very hard to identify the specific function. Some of, the food, some of our food taboos obviously have a direct material payoff, uh, helping people to avoid Poisonous foods, uh, the example here that enough people know about um, the idea, the, the, some nice work on looking at sort of the, the handful of ash that gets added to corn maize when we cook it, uh, that improves the capacity to absorb niacin. So even though it's, you know, it's done as a matter, well, this is the way we always do it. Uh, it took a long time to figure out what the real benefits were of doing that. And there's a direct material payoff, but there's lots of uh, taboos that don't uh, clearly just don't have a, a uh, material payoff, um, we can see that partly because we see such different rules around, around the world. So what we look at in, in this paper is uh, we're looking at a multi-agent reinforcement learning environment, and we're trying to figure out how to implement this idea, ideas about norms and silly rules. Uh, in this environment, we have eight agents. They're in a grid world uh, where they're just foraging for, uh, for food, for berries. Uh, there's an abundance of berries. There's no tragedy of the commons. They're not going to run out. Um, but there is in this, uh, this, this environment a berry that is poisonous, uh, but it has a delayed impact on health. So it's hard for our reinforcement learning agent to learn simply through eating and getting sick, hey, that's the one you should avoid eating. It's going to take there's a long delay before that uh, shows up in the payoff structure. Um, so we, we implement norms in this environment with the idea that uh, with, with agents changing color when they have eaten a berry that's been marked as taboo. So we're just determining, is it, is it we, we, we as the experiment designers are saying, let's call this one a taboo berry. If an agent in our environment eats that berry, they will get the mark of cane, they will uh, turn a different color. The agent won't see that, but other agents will see it. And then we equip our agents with uh, punishing beings. They can deliver punishment. You could think of it as criticism or mocking or uh, something uh, or exclusion, but um, uh, it's costly to the agent to punish. Uh, there's a large cost to the victim of being punished. And then the agent gets a significant reward if the punishment is directed at a marked agent, that is to say an agent that has violated a taboo. So um, there's a picture of what the environment looks like um, on the computer. So, um, so now we look at three different normative conditions. We look at an environment where there are no rules, so there are no taboo berries. You can eat whatever you want. And nobody gets a benefit for uh, punishing you. Uh, we look at an environment that just has an important rule. The important rule is that the poisonous berry is taboo. Um, this is, in fact, a berry that 
you shouldn't eat. So it would actually be a good thing if you stayed away from it for any reason, but staying away from it because you could get punished for eating it is as good a reason as any. Um, and then we look at an environment with also a silly rule uh, where we have the poisonous berry is tabooed, but we also have a harmless berry that's tabooed. So there's, there's no reason to say don't eat the yellow berries, uh, but we've introduced that as a taboo in the environment, meaning that an agent that punishes somebody so sorry, if, if an agent eats the, 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 that, that berry, they become marked, other agents get, get, get rewarded for punishing that agent. And what we're looking for here is what's the impact of, um, what, what's the capacity for these agents? First of all, these are reinforcement learning agents. They don't have a model of this behavior. Um, they are just discovering, oh, eating berries produces reward. Uh, Punishing people is costly, but oh, if I punish somebody who's turned this color, I, I get an additional reward. Um, oh, if I eat that berry over there, turns out I get punished, I bear a cost, stop eating that berry. So we're just looking for the emergence of, of, of that learning, that behavior. And we wanna look at how these different normative conditions affect the learning uh, of those behaviors. And what we find is that the environment with silly rules, and this confirms our hypothesis, Agents learn the punishing behaviors and the avoidance of taboo berries better and uh, more durably. So in this, um, I'm gonna skip the, 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 the first panel here. Um, the, uh, let's see, what have I got? So the green, the green line is the silly rule condition. That's where the poisonous berry and the non-poisonous berry are taboo. We see in the second panel here, um, the total times uh, punished uh, is higher uh, in that green condition. The red is the one with just the taboo, the poisonous berry taboo. And what we see is that, but punishment actually drops off because, and why does it drop off? It drops off because agents uh, learn more quickly not to eat um, any of the taboo berries, poisonous and non-poisonous. Uh, the collective return is in the last panel, panel F. And that's showing that particularly through the, uh, the, 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 um, the sort of the middle of this range, um, the, learn, the, the total collective return for the group is higher. That green line is higher than the red line, um, meaning that the combined effect of spending resources on punishing and avoiding a harmless berry that you could otherwise eat um, is paying off. And this is actually a little bit easier to see um, in, in this picture here. Uh, what we're showing here is on the vertical axis, um, this is the, um, the amount of punishment that's happening in the early stages of this learning process. Um, and uh, the green line is again, the environment with the silly rule as well as the important rule and the red line has just the, uh, the important rule. So we're seeing uh, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis, there is more punishment happening early in that environment. And along the uh, horizontal axis is the amount of time in the later stages that agents spend being poisoned by the poison berry. And you can see that, that's, um, uh, that there's less of that happening with the, with the uh, green than the red. Um, so we had a question whether or not the agents are really learning about the berry rules or is it something else because we don't know what's happening inside this complex reinforcement learning model. So we actually developed something um, like a psych lab experiment where we took agents out of the learning process at different points and then we stuck them alone in a room uh, with a single berry and watched how they uh, behaved. Did they, did they move towards the berry or did they stay away from the berry? And what we saw in that environment is the first panel is when there's no rules at all. Again, the green is um, uh, the silly rule condition and the red is the, um, uh, the, the uh, poisonous berry, just the single important rule condition. What we see is when there's no rules, uh, the, the vertical axis is, is the amount of uh, time spent moving towards the berry in, in the space. Um, so you can sort of see that as, you know, they, all of these look the same and, you know, 70% of the time they're moving towards the berry. Uh, in the second panel, we've got the poison berry is tabooed and what we see in that red line is uh, that's effective. Uh, agents are indeed learning to stay away from that poison berry when it's tabooed. And in the third uh, panel, what we're seeing is that in that 
silly rule condition where both the poison and the harmless berry are taboo, um, the, green, um, the, the green line and the red line are both dropping off. They're dropping off faster and they are staying further away from that berry. Um, so I think confirming um, that that's what the agents are learning. So the insight there is that uh, our silly rules are supporting the learning of these normative behaviors. Um, those normative behaviors are supporting better choices. And uh, we're sort of raising questions now, but okay, is this something that helps us with thinking about generalizable learning? And, and this is, I think, the real payoff here is thinking about, and this is a point I'd like to emphasize um, for our AI community is to say, again, normativity is just fundamental um, to, to human intelligence. Um, it is, uh, there's, there's work that suggests that normativity emerges before language emerges, uh, which is really, really fascinating. Um, normativity is core to human intelligence and therefore it's central to um, uh, building artificial intelligence, uh, achieving goals, which is what we're doing, building AIs uh, in a world populated with humans requires agents to be capable of participating in normative social orders. So why does the science of AI need a science of normativity? Because uh, we, we don't understand enough right now about, at a predictive level, about how systems of human normativity work. Um, and that's the end of, so I did say an hour. Okay, so I was not too bad. Now I'm just trying, I think the problem is I need to get out of this and I have to be um, my other monitor. That's it, okay. So um, I'm actually gonna move over to my other monitor because my... Sorry, this is the, 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 the horror of, um, there we go, presenter mode. Okay, all right, I'm back. I can now see the chat, so. Um, Yeah, so we do have a question in chat from uh, from Amir that uh, goes back to some of the uh, the earlier discussion of uh, values and how those are established. Okay, Amir, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. This is Amir. Uh, so okay. So I'm uh, I'm not really expert in this, but uh, so my question is that basically, if I understand your stance correctly, you're basically saying that value is not something that we set a priori, but it is an emergent property of uh, the society. Uh, but I believe at least I think in, uh, like in ethics and moral philosophy, there are beliefs that there are, uh, we can come up with uh, some certain values a priori, just by reasoning without actually uh, going through any kind of social contract. Uh, so this, I feel that this is somehow Kind of contradicting where you are starting, uh, because some people would say, like, say, Immanuel Kant would say that, well, if you think enough, uh, we can come up with these certain principles, and then if you follow them, that's all that we need. It's not a normative process that comes from negotiations in the society, and it doesn't have any kind of evolutionary uh, aspect in it. Uh, so, can you kind of uh, enlighten me? What is the difference between these two viewpoints? Yes, yes. So, so it's helpful to think about the difference between an internal perspective on a normative system and an external perspective. And I'm heavily doing the external perspective. So I would say, um, you know, Kantian reasoning, moral reasoning, those are normative systems. They are systems that are structured, they have characteristics, they work in particular ways, we have experts in them, we have ways in which they are uh, generated and, you know, quote unquote, inf enforced. It's I mean, part, of, part of thinking about those systems is actually thinking about how they generate reasons for moral individuals to act in particular ways. But I would say, like, I'm the, I'm the visitor um, from outside that system. We used to say from Mars, but I think we have to say from Venus now, right? That we discovered life on Venus. Um, that that I, I'm that visitor from Venus who says, hmm, how do these people do this? And, you know, Kantian systems of reasoning would be an example of an institution, or at least a piece of an institution that's playing that role. And that's embedded in socialization processes for 
young people in the West, the kinds of discourse we have, the fact that we have communities that engage in conversations like this, um, and that there is a, there's a, something that we can do in those systems to say, you know, what would be the right way to think about the answer to this question? Okay, uh, so I guess I understand it a bit better, but suppose that kind of person from Venus comes and then uh, comes in, I don't know, uh, in a society, uh, say, uh, 1930s in Germany. Uh, everyone believes in a set of beliefs, and that uh, person from Venus wants to design an AI system that is compatible with uh, humans, and its sample was from that Germany in that time. Yes. So uh, what happens in that case? It would, be it would put values in a robot that is very different from what we actually believe should be the true values. Yeah, so that's precisely why I say we can't think about the challenge of aligning AI systems as choosing a set of values to put inside the machine. Okay. We have to figure out, so all of, we, human agents continuously have solved this problem over human evolution. How do we generate humans and create the conditions under which they think and talk and behave so as to maintain the stability and, this, and the, the characteristics of a normative system. So when I think about how do you approach, well, why is this important to understand that it's not about selecting a set of values? And that, it's precisely because as you're pointing out, you know, well, okay, what are you gonna do? Pick up the values from 1930s Germany? What are you gonna do? Pick up the values from Silicon Valley today? Um, right? it, it, it's that you, you don't want to freeze that in there. No human society would survive if it just froze that in place. Okay. We're all engaged in this process. So it's, I think it's the challenge of how do you build machines that can integrate into these normative systems. This is why I think it's really critical to think about them as systems and study the characteristics of those systems and understand it's not just random weird stuff that humans have a, a whole bunch of stupid rules. Actually, there's a really important thing. And if you just put important rules into your machine, suppose you dropped a robot down among the Awa Indians and said, make arrows. And you said, you know, your payoff is, is producing arrows that work. And you said, but ignore that stupid stuff about what color the feathers are or what words you say when you use them or keeping them warm over the fire. Um, that robot would fail in that environment. It might actually disrupt the stability of that society. Right. Okay, thank you. And uh, looks like we've got a question from Brian as well. Brian. Yeah, I hi. Anticipated. Um, I anticipated, Brian. Well, I, I should, I should uh, keep you, uh, I should not do it so that I violate your expectations, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> So there's a, I'm concerned about the relationship between normativity and values and be, well, in, the normative question about the relationship between values and behavior. So in psychology, um, you know, there was this whole history of behaviorism and stuff, and it basically failed because it turns out that you can't, there's too many heteros paribus positions. These things are good to do, except in some circumstances, they're actually bad to do, or, or these things are bad to do, except some certain things are good and so on and so forth. And basically the effort to associate generalities with behavior um, was in the end recognized as actually not possible. And my concern is that aren't you vulnerable by characterizing uh, normativity in the institutions that um, bring norms forward as classifications of behavior and uh, um, well, and the reinforcement, and um, let's just say that, the classifications of behavior. I would have thought that being deliberative or being just or being fair and so on and so forth aren't ever going to be um, summarizable as classifications of behavior. That it's going to, in the end, the framework will suffer from exactly what happened to behaviorism and psychology, that you can't get at what matters about normativity classifying behavior. You have to have values and say, you know, to a soldier, don't do this, do this, whatever. But in the end, be honorable, right? In the end, you have to rely on values, not classifications of behavior in order to establish a normative system. Well, I, 
Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I think part, part of your point is that we need, so, so your values, principles, very rich concepts and actually quite potentially quite complex concepts. And this is, um, but at the end of the, and absolutely that's right. That's a feature of, uh, norm, of, of robust, rich, adaptive, normative systems. So this is like the, the point of the incomplete contracting uh, insight in the paper is like, you know, you, you can never actually write down all the rules. And I think this is an important thing for AI, uh, uh, AI researchers to also understand, right? You, you can never write down the rules. You're never going to be able to specify. That's what, that's what the iRobot runaround story is about. You can never specify. So you need rich concepts like reasonable, honorable, right? And that's what we see in our robust systems, that we have those kinds of robust, uh, 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 open-ended, open-textured, subject to lots of interpretation. But so if you say, you know, you want to say to your soldier, be honorable, right? Ultimately, if that, that's a system for, at the end of the day, say, okay, that behavior that was taken, was it honorable or not? And we have, in some domains, we just have ongoing discourse and, and dialogue and debate about the classification. I say it's honorable, you say it's not. Uh, and then as we build legal institutions and other, we say we take some of those and we put them and say, you know what? Our society needs a resolution to that, to that question to move forward. So we're gonna create a court system and then a Supreme Court. And the rule of our, that normative system, that component of our normative system is, you know, once the Supreme Court says, you know, constitutional, not constitutional, violation, not violation, that coordinates the community. Of course, many of us, and that's what makes our systems very robust is that there is actually ongoing debate and discussion and press and so on. So this is why I sort of said in response to that earlier question, we have super, super complex as we don't, because I'm trying to do some theorizing about this, this ultimate classification. And that's a really stunning thing, at least about law. Complex, complex cases, at the end of the day, we say guilty, not guilty, breach, not breach, constitutional, not constitutional, right? We end the story, we end the question there. And that's a really important function that, that, that courts play. And I think you didn't, and we know that if you didn't have that, I mean, there are systems that don't have that. I once looked at systems in Buddhist Tibet. It was <laughs> it's a lovely book called The Golden Yoke. And there's no concept of the issue has been decided because if parties keep arguing, they say, well, I guess you got to keep coming back. And they won't say as they will say in our systems, sorry, we answered that question before and you got a final court order and, and you have to bring us something new. Yeah, the question, I mean, I won't go on. I just say, in the end, it might be, suppose I agree with this. I don't actually, but suppose I agree, look, in the end, a given action has to be ruled on or something. The question is whether you can get generalizations out of particular, whether the generalizations can be framed, even if in the end, a behavior is normatively okay or not. The question is whether the generalizations about the behavior can be expressed in behavioral terms or whether actually the generalizations are gonna to have to be expressed in value-laden terms because in fact you can't get at behavioral generalizations for exactly the reasons you said you could never specify a rule so that's the question but we can go on yeah 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 i i, I, th I think that's exactly what a sophisticated person who looks at our very very sophisticated legal reasoning moral reasoning systems would say is that's that that our systems don't work very well if they just for example are a little compendium of this one was okay that one was not okay they actually need to have to be connected. They need to be generalizable. That's going back to this point I was making about what are the attributes that system has to have in order to serve this function well of coordinating people and incentivizing them and so on. And um, looks like we have a couple related questions in the chat about the um, uh, universality Thanks. of values. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, yeah. Uh, is this Julian? Julian and, uh, and Ushnish as well. Julian, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi, just thinking about the history of uh, contemporary laws and values that comes from this universalist idea of, uh, of the human. And I was wondering, is there a limit then in universalism when we think of normativity and AI? 
so say a bit, how are you using the term universalism there? Well, um, um, I'm thinking, for example, of, uh, so I'm becoming part of the uh, team of Professor Wong about human rights and, and AI, and I was thinking how these human rights uh, come from this idea of universal, they apply for everyone equally. Uh, but I'm thinking of uh, notions, for example, of silly rules and thinking of how it all depends on context as well. So I, I think like who decides on what counts as a silly rule, what, who decides what counts as not a silly rule. So it, 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 this makes me think like, is there a limit then of universalism from, from the, this French idea of universalism, you know, of, of uh, uh, the rules that apply to everyone equally uh, in a context when um, AI has to learn what counts as a rule, as a silly rule, and so on. Yeah, it, it's, it's why I really emphasize that the, what I'm sort of in this very bloodless way, describing just as the rule sets that define groups, right? Um, that they are about the group, and I think it's something critical, like, and, 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 and there's many different intersecting layers. We belong to different, all kinds of groups. We have our families, we have our religious communities, we have the, the universal human, uh, group, but I think that that's that's exactly why I'm saying you know you, uh, what we know is as we get more and more abstract, as we get to that like what does everybody have a right to? So we say everybody has a right to life. Okay, well actually it turns out it's really really complicated in lots and lots of settings to say what that what that actually means and requires. When we have, and this is where I guess I will sort of just keep leaning on this thing that that Brian is pushing me on is at the end of the day somebody has done something. They have taken an action, something has happened. And others are saying, shouldn't have done that, right? Shouldn't have married your daughter at the age of 13, right? Uh, shouldn't have, um, uh, you know, done, or genital cut, cutting. I mean, it, it really complex questions. Um, and I guess I wanna say, I'm not trying, I'm trying to do some theorizing. What do we do as theorists? We strip a lot of the, you know, the stuff that makes us feel really good about, about the world out of things so we can see some structure. But it's all that complex stuff that folds in that then does that. So I'm saying if we don't, if we, if we go around thinking, oh, well, I can just take the, you know, the treaty on the rights of the child and stick it in my, my AI, most lawyers would say, oh, that's not going to work. That's not going to work, and we know this in lots of, I mean, part of my work on this came from trying to think about how you build rule of law in environments where we just know there is not very reliable rule of law. It doesn't matter what you've written down on that piece of paper. If what you're really trying to do is change the behavior on the ground, like to make sure that girls go to school and don't, don't get married before they're 18, you need way more than the declaration of a human right to an education to accomplish that. And we really do not understand very well how those systems work. And that's what we want to understand. We want to understand how do you change those communities? So now if you think you're dropping AI in there and your AI is running the platform or is operating your rules about market stalls or whatever, okay, so you're going to have to make sure it is integrated into those pretty, in some cases, pretty local communities. So the universe, when we use the term universal, um, uh, Barry Weingast and I were saying, you know, it, 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 we're now thinking about it from that functional perspective. They say, if, if, if you don't figure out how to make this valuable to everybody in the, to, to enough people in the community, you're not going to achieve it. So actually there's a, a kind of a stunning, you know, distressing maybe, but, you know, you, you better not just change the rule about girls getting married because you're going to need a lot of people who think they have no payoff from that to see a benefit in moving from the old set of rules to the, to the new set of rules. So it's far more complex. And I, this is, I think, the reason, go back to my title, why does the science of AI need a science of normativity? Because these are really, really hard questions that we, I don't think we do enough careful structural work on. And we carry with us and we import into this challenging area fairly simplistic notions about what law is like, what norms are like, what values are, and we're so deeply embedded. The reason I use the Awa Indians, which can feel kind of insulting, is to say, because at least that's something we can look at and, and you get some of that perspective of the person from Venus, right? Um, because we are so good at ours, we don't even recognize the fact that 
we are currently just immersed in an extremely dense normative environment where each of us is actually, I'm watching things like, am I seeing somebody's frown right now on this screen? How do I, I'm really, really hard to give this talk over Zoom because I don't get all this feedback about when I'm kind of maybe treading where I should not tread and so on. So really challenging questions. It's a hard, hard, hard area. <laughs> and that's why it's so urgent, I think. Um, Avery, you're up next. Hi, yes, thank you. As, as a, a lover of Kafka, I'm really excited about the idea that society is structured around silly rules. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this idea about silly rules and how they contribute in your findings to group coherence and resilience. Uh, and it was making me wonder, in your view, would you agree that human language as such sort of constitutes a uniquely exemplary system of silly rules? And here I'm thinking about uh, one of the great theorists of silly rules, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, who showed that the linguistic relations that constitute a language are arbitrary. So they're, they're not natural or necessary. They're in some ways low cost, but one could argue about that. They're, they're arbitrary, right? They're, they're silly rules, but they work. Um, so I was thinking about if you would agree with that, um, are these silly rules uh, in, in some way a system of intelligibility, right? Could we talk about how those silly rules are functioning as it's making a world intelligible, not just yeah. coherent and resilient, but also intelligible. And, and if that, if we think about that as intelligibility that sort of builds onto normativity, um, how do we separate those out? Uh, do we need both to have that resilience? And I guess the kind of maybe a shorter version of that question is like, if AI could learn human language, would it have fulfilled its quota sort of of silly rules, right? If it could learn, that human language, will that be enough silly rules to make that AI ethical? Is that possible? Oh, okay, all right, so no, you, you got me with that last bit there. Um, so, so when I'm thinking, so actually intelligibility or legibility, we actually talk, think about, and, and language I think is uh, clearly a, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of silly rules in language like we pronounce this word this way and not that way. That's what di different languages are. That's what different dialects are. And, um, and, and it's normatively enforced, right? You know, if you, if you just continue to pronounce a word differently than the community pronounces it, um, even if it doesn't actually affect your capacity to communicate, everybody knows what you mean when you say that word that way. Nonetheless, the community will give you a little bit of feedback that says that's not how we do it. And, and I think there's a, this is, you know, there, there's definitely disciplining around that. Um, now, would it be sufficient? Um, so, so maybe, maybe an AI that becomes adept, I don't know, do we want to think this is what's happening in GPT-3? Like one of the things that GPT-3, this massive language model that um, generates text that OpenAI has, has put out, um, uh, one of the things it kind of stunningly do does is it picks up on the silly rules about the order of words, uh, the, the, the structure, the style, right? I think we, we looked at it, right? We said it, it can learn to write in poetry, it can write in prose, it can, um, it can uh, it, and, and, and a lot of worse things actually as well, that it picks up, we use this word rather than that word to describe a person. Um, so it's, but I, but I don't think that would be sufficient. I mean, in, in, in this model, silly rules are performing, and this is why I think it's also, it's just not mimicry, right? So there's in, the reason silly rules are playing an important role is because they're informative. And what they're informative about is the state of the system. They are telling people in the system, hey, are we in a stable equilibrium or not? Are things about to change? And therefore, what should I do because they're about to change? So they're providing information about the normative state. The silly rules are not useful. If, if the silly rule about language doesn't tell me something about the state with respect to the stuff that does matter, mm -hmm. right? Then, then it's just pointless. It's, it can't perform this function. Um, so I'm not, I don't think I would say, well, if, if, if AIs could learn the silly rules of language, then they would be ethical. Because they, it would have to, it would only be if it was pr being performed in the context of they too could get good at reading. Okay, like, are people following the rules around here? I read that the rule is you stop on, on red, 
right? I, 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 I've, I've been, I've been, you know, I've got that in my program, but are people actually stopping on the red light? Uh, what if there's flooding happening? What if uh, the lights are out? What if we sat here for two hours in the middle of the night and nobody else is around, right? It's, uh, but I, they would have that, they would have that capacity. So I sort of put it out there to say, it's again, as a demonstration project to say, so here I'm going to demonstrate thinking about systems tells you something about a feature of human normative we don't think much about and you can easily just completely overlook in building your AI system because you'd say oh let's be good engineers and make sure it only does the important stuff but I don't think it would make the math yeah. thank you yeah. okay oh we've got two minutes left so I think I'm uh, Brent is telling me um, that uh, we are we are wrapping up. Um, we have our, so we are meeting weekly at this time, three o'clock till four thirty, um, and we have a great lineup for the rest of the semester. Um, Yovana, it is or will soon be up on the website, I think, so that people can can take a look. The next uh, week's event description is up. We're just waiting for a registration link, but it'll be up really shortly. So we right, great, and. Um, uh, Marzia Gassimi uh, is going to be our speaker next week. Her title is Don't Explain Yourself. There's the AI in the middle there. Don't Explain Yourself, Exploring Healthy Models in Machine Learning for Health. Um, thanks uh, to everybody for, for joining us today. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I'll be talking to you all some more soon. Thanks. Take care.